Good evening. Um, Robin, thank you for that generous introduction. And hello, neighbor. <laughs> I've actually um, been living in Harlem since 2012. 2012. And it's really great here. People are really polite, very, very warm. Um, I also wanted to uh, just admit that I wanted to do this talk because I got really very, very high cool points with my son being able to on, be on the same panel with Adam and Christian and Paulita. <laughs> my son is a freshman in college and he's like, you're speaking with them. And I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> they let a novelist come here. <laughs> so thank you very much for letting me be here with you guys. And I also want to thank you for coming because I'm really excited to be part of the inaugural program for Sayers and Doers. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be a Sayer and a Doer and about the binary of being a Sayer and a Doer because I don't know if you know this, but of course, you're supposed to be a Doer and not a Sayer because talk is cheap and that's what happens in America. But I wanted to say, just to sort of defend this idea of saying because it took me almost a lifetime to learn how to be a sayer, and I could not be a doer until I learned how to be a sayer. And I'll share that with you, um, because I've never been much of a sayer. I came to America in 1976 when I was seven years old, and I came with my parents and my two sisters. I'm the middle child. I'm the well-adjusted one. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I couldn't speak English and I didn't know how to read or write in English. And also, I was pathologically awkward. And I'll demonstrate that for you, because when I was in first grade in Korea, I was the tallest one in my class from both boys and girls. And they made me sit all the way in the back because I had a daydreaming problem. Now they call it something else, but I was that kid who was spacing out in the back. So I would sit in the back, and instead of paying attention to my teacher, I would walk back and forth. And one day, my first grade teacher in Korea got so fed up with me that she called me to the front of the classroom. And because I'm so bad at reading social cues, I actually went up there. And she said, put out your hands like this. And I thought I was going to get a present. <laughs> well, she took out a ruler, and she hit me really, really hard. And I started to cry because I wasn't supposed to be doing that in the back of the classroom, and I was supposed to be paying, atten paying attention. And my mother was called immediately thereafter because there was something clearly wrong with me. And my mother, who was a piano teacher then, a very, very gifted pianist, she was a very popular piano teacher in the neighborhood. She came to school, and she was not upset with me at all. She spoke to the teacher, and I have no idea what was said to this day. I keep thinking like I should ask, but I don't really want to know <laughs> because I have an idea that she knew there was something wrong with me, but she didn't want to tell me. So she took me to the bakery and she bought me a piece of cake and she took me home. And I never did it again. Like, and by the way, I can still be mollified with a piece of cake. <laughs> um, I share this story because a year later when we moved to America, I had a double problem of not being able to talk well, and I literally didn't know English. But my sisters, who both didn't know English, immediately picked it up, and they were put into the SP class. And if you go to um, PS 102 in 1976, you would know that SP means special progress, which means that you're a smart kid. And I was languishing in the dumb class for several years. And my mother, who believes in natural intelligence, and by that she means like, you're just smart or you're not. And she figured she has two good ones. <laughs> so I'll be fine. <laughs> so she had the hedge. So I go to PS 102. I have, we arrive in March of 1976. So I have exactly three months of second grade. And then it's summertime. And my parents, uh, at the time, they had absolutely no money at all, hardly. So they bought an interest in a newspaper stand in an office building. So if you can imagine a really, really crummy office building on 30th and Broadway, covered in soot, that was their business. And so they had a bottle of Windex and they cleaned it, but they were really busy for six days a week. And so I went to the public library in Elmhurst and that's where I learned how to read. 
And I'm not exactly sure I, how I learned how to read, but I did. And I started to read Lois Lenski regional historical novels. And she wrote about um, migrant workers and the families of migrant workers. And then I graduated and I read Betsy and Tacey novels, which are about sister, friends who grew up in Minnesota. And for some reason, like, I just found myself in these stories. And then librarians, I think, felt sorry for me. <laughs> and they started to give me other books. And I started to go through almost all of 19th century European novels and then almost all of American 19th century novels. And by the way, I really had no friends because I didn't know how to have a conversation. So even as I started to understand English, I didn't know how to enter. Like when you saw two popular girls or two unpopular girls talking, I didn't know how to kind of go in and break the um, conversation. I'm still stumbling, as you can tell. So I read through all these books. And finally, I tried to figure out what it is that I liked about these books. And I realized that I love the characters who were really brave. They could do things and say things that I couldn't do. And then I, and then I realized that I wanted to be brave. And I wanted to do and say the things that I was afraid to do. So I decided that in America, and also in the West, if you want people to think that you're bright, you have to learn how to talk well, which was terrifying for a person like me. So I went to high school, and I joined the debate team. And for one incredibly painful year, I learned how to argue. And learning how to argue is way tougher than learning how to talk. And I did this, and it was just a disaster. <laughs> and then in my high school, they didn't teach public speaking. Because I figured I don't really want to learn how to argue forever, because that's not a very good way to make friends. <laughs> so I took a public speaking class one summer. And the following summer, I took another public speaking class, because I was so terrible at it. And this is what I'm going to share with you, which allows me to be here today in front of you. And I'm going to give you this one important lesson, and this will save you years of trauma if any of you is afraid of public speaking. And this is my one lesson. Nearly every single person in the room is rooting for you. Why didn't someone tell me? <laughs> but when someone actually leaves her house and comes into a room like this, and even if you're a captive audience, everybody wants to be entertained and enlightened. So they don't want you to suck. <laughs> they really want you to be good. And if you remember that they really want you to be good, and they have sympathy for you, then you realize that we're actually all on the same side. Now, normally, I don't talk so much about talking out loud, but it was really important for me to learn how to say that I had wishes that I didn't know I could even articulate. And when I went to college, I learned how to express myself in another way besides talking, because talking was so painful. I learned how to write, and you might think, how can she go to a fancy college if she doesn't know how to write? But that's not necessarily the same thing, because writing homework is not the same thing as writing a book. And I think the hardest thing for me was that despite the fact that I had read way more than a regular child should have at that point, it never occurred to me that a person like me could be a writer. And I think whenever I meet young people who have my background, I always try to explain to them, the imagination that you need for stories is one thing, but the greater imagination that you need is to believe that you can actually be a writer. Because for me, that was a far greater leap to cross the chasm in a world where I never saw people like me be a writer to a world where I could even imagine that I could exist. Now, in 1989, I hadn't met Christian, so I didn't know that history was valuable. <laughs> And I still decided to major in history, and I'm very glad that I did, but I didn't know what to do with my life. And one day, the university chaplain, who felt sorry for me, because again, like I had all these issues, he invited me to a lecture, and I went, because I'm very compliant. <laughs> and I was the only student at this lecture, so which means that you can't leave. And I parked myself next to the cookies, if you're sensing a theme, <laughs> with the sweets, it's true. Um, and I listened, and it was an American missionary who had gone to Osaka to work with the Korean Japanese population. 
And he taught us about, he taught me and the organizer about the history of the Koreans in Japan, which I knew nothing about. So the Koreans arrived in Japan in 1910 to 1945, and it was during the era of the colonial occupation of Japan. So Japan was in charge of Korea, and Korea became effectively its breadbasket and its labor source for Japan's wishes to expand. It became kind of like a colonial power in the East. Anyway, so I'm learning about this, and it's a very, very, very sad history. And I thought, oh, well, it's really sad. I wish I could go. Yeah. However, I thought I should stay because I can't leave now. And he told us this one story that changed my life. And it's why I'm here today. He told us a story about a 13-year-old boy in his parish who climbed up to his apartment building roof, and he jumped off to his death. And this little boy had no indications to his parents that he was upset or that he felt this way. So his parents were devastated, and they went through all of his things, and they found his middle school yearbook. And in the middle school yearbook, they found that his Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong, go back to Korea, I hate you. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And this story engraved itself in my brain. I graduated as a history major, and I went to law school, and I practiced corporate law because I'm a very good immigrant daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't keep it up, so then I quit because I figured how hard could it be to write a book. <laughs> I wrote one novel, and I got an agent very quickly because I went to a fancy college, and it was rejected by everybody. And then I sat down and I said, I'm going to write another novel. And I wrote another novel. And it was about the Korean Japanese. And it was horrid. <laughs> so I couldn't send it out. I couldn't send it out. And then I read a really beautiful novel by V.S. Naipaul, who is absolutely a racist and a sexist. However, he's a beautiful novelist. <laughs> he is. And he wrote a book called The House from Mr. Biswas. Like, he says that women don't matter. <laughs> I'm sure I don't matter. But anyway, so... I read the book, it brought me to tears, and I said, you know what, if V.S. Naipaul could write a book about his neighborhood in Trinidad, I could write about Elmhurst, Queens, and I did. And that book became my first published novel. And then in 2007, my book came out, it's called Free for Millionaires, and that year my husband, who's sitting over there, got a job in Japan. And I didn't want to go to Japan. It's a great place to visit, but I didn't want to live in Japan. But I couldn't get a new husband. <laughs> so I decided that I would go to Japan. And my son was keen on it because he thought Pikachu would be there <laughs> at the time. So in 2007 to 2011, I lived there and I interviewed dozens upon dozens of Korean Japanese. And I read ethnographies and anthropologies and sociology books and history books about the Korean Japanese. I visited every single place the Korean Japanese people lived. And I learned that the reason why my second book about the Korean Japanese was so horrible is because I had written a project with a bias. I had written about an oppressed community where the Korean Japanese people do not see themselves as an oppressed people. They see themselves exactly like the way they see you and me is normal people who have families, who have love, and who wish just to be get respected. So I threw away the manuscript, and I started to write all over again, and I wrote about one family who makes Japan their home. Now, for parts of my life, I can absolutely say that I'm a sayer, and I'm a doer, but I have to admit here that there's a part of me that really wonders why I'm a finisher, this book in 1989, which means I've spent three decades of my life working on one project. And perhaps you should say it and do it, but not finish it in such a long time. <laughs> and that little story about the boy became about 1% of the book. It's not a book about suicide at all or bullying. It's actually a book about resilience and love. And I figured out the reason why I wrote that book is not because I'm Korean. 
I wrote that book because I'm an American. I'm a naturalized American citizen. And when I was growing up, I had never had an experience of a public school teacher calling me from the back of the room and standing up in the front and hitting me with a ruler. I had librarians who gave me books. When I didn't speak English, I had been treated so kindly by so many Americans that I knew that the way the Korean Japanese were treated was wrong. So if I have to look for a reason as to why I've spent three decades of my life working on one project, I would say that it is because that the overwhelming goodness of the people that I have met in New York City taught me that I have something to say, something to do, and something to finish. Thank you.